our slide. Um, so hello to everyone and thank you for making time to be on this webinar today. Um, I am Heather Whitson. I'm a geriatrician and clinical investigator at Duke University and I uh, co-lead the MCC Scholars Program um, along with my co-leader Leah Hansen. Leah, do you want to say hello? Sure. Hi everybody. I'm Leah Hansen. I'm a neuroscientist and senior research investigator at Health Partners Institute in Minnesota. And we will be sort of tag teaming this presentation today. Um, and along also later, you'll also hear from some of our um, patient advisory panel, um, which is a really important part of our program also. Um, I'll hold off on introductions there until we get to that part of the program. Um, but uh, Leah, I think um, you're up now and then uh, I'll jump back in later. Sounds good. Um, and we just wanted to let everybody know we have plenty of the time, time at the end so that you can put your questions in. So if you want to type those in the chat or we can unmute you at the end um, to ask those questions. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, we're here today to talk about the MCC Scholars Program. The purpose of this program is to create a, a group of emerging leaders that are really committed to the issues of MCCs or multiple chronic conditions. And um, this program um, has been running for a couple of years. We are going to be selecting up to 10 scholars in each year. This will be our third group of scholars. Um, we are holding a virtual workshop. We wish it could be in person, um, but in April 28th to 29th, this will be sort of the kickoff for the scholars program um, over those two days. And it's held in conjunction with the annual um, Pepper Center meeting or Older Adult Independence Centers. And um, it's, a, it's a really great event. That's a, our main kickoff event for the scholars group. Um, in addition to participation in that um, virtual workshop, uh, we're asking our scholars to participate in six webinar-based career development opportunities. And our program for the scholars really has four pillars. Uh, the first is the significance of, of chronic, uh, multiple chronic conditions. The second is resources and tools for MCC researchers. Third is the important aspect of enabling a real meaningful patient caregiver engagement in your research. And the fourth is professional leadership development um, for you as investigators. And again, we're, we're looking to grow this community of, of researchers with this commitment um, to, to grow MCC research. Next slide. So why MCC research? Why are we focused on that? Um, multiple chronic conditions is the most common um, chronic condition. So people as they age and don't have a single disease, but they have combinations of disease and multiple diseases. So we know 77% of people over 65 years of age have two or more chronic medical conditions. And in regular clinical trials, patients with multiple chronic conditions are excluded by very narrow inclusion exclusion criteria. We're typically focused on one disease at a time. But it's really important to look at the whole person. Um, in addition, when we look at cost of care, adults with multiple chronic conditions really use a lot of healthcare services. Um, looking at some of the data for Medicare beneficiaries, 12% of of those patients with six or more chronic condition account for 43% of the total spending, uh, half of the spending on hospitalization, and almost 70% of post-acute medical care costs. So it's really important. Um, it's very common and it's very costly. Next slide, please. So here's a, a list of some of the um, benefits of participating in the uh, MCC Scholars Program. As a part of the uh, kickoff event, there'll be an opportunity to submit a draft of a grant for a mock review as part of that uh, kickoff meeting. One of the things um, we valued and we've heard from our last cohorts of scholars is there's really strong peer collaboration we see people meeting each other that um, may be interested in writing a grant together, working together, publishing together, and peer collaboration um, is, is really important 
uh, to be successful. And this is a great way to find a group of like-minded individuals um, studying uh, the similar uh, topic. There's also the opportunity for senior mentorship through identifying um, investigators in your area of expertise through really our strong two national um, networks. So the Aging Initiative brings together the Healthcare Systems Research Network or the HCSRN and these older adult independence centers, the Pepper Centers. And both are, have strong networks of investigators focused on aging research. So in addition to mentorship opportunities, there's also a really important um, chance to network and to be connected to, to others in the field. Additionally, at the kickoff meeting, um, we in the past we have, and we plan to do so again, we have had strong participation um, from NIA. And so those, um, the leaders and project officers participate in our, our meetings and our, our conferences. And um, they're really, the NIA is really a large part and connected to the aging initiative. So there's an opportunity to develop relationships there. Uh, you'll see on the pictures, we have our cohort one pictures on the upper right. Um, you can see Heather and I and Steve and Elise, some mentors, and then uh, part of our class there. And then that was our first year where we had an in-person meeting. The bottom picture shows the opportunity to present your research as a poster um, to interact with folks as a part of the network. Um, we didn't have that opportunity last year. We're exploring how we can increase those networking opportunities for our virtual meeting in 2021. Next slide. So who should apply? So there is a requirement that you do hold your degree. We've gotten emails saying, I'm almost there. I have my date scheduled. Um, but know that this is an opportunity that um, is an annual event, um, so you'll be welcome to apply next year. Um, it's also important to show some commitment to research in a field that's relevant to multiple chronic conditions and or aging. Preference is given to applicants who, who are in earlier stages of their careers, so people who haven't necessarily received an R01 grant or tenure, but if you've attained those things recently, you still will be considered. Um, you need to be able to attend the, the workshop on April 28th to the 29th. So if you have a conflict on those dates, um, you, you, I wouldn't um, consider applying. That's really key um, to the program. We encourage people, um, early stage investigators and individuals from groups who are underrepresented in research careers. For example, women, ethnic and racial minorities, uh, people with disabilities, and we, I guess, really key to the program is uh, we were looking for people who wish to collaborate with others and who are interested in multiple chronic conditions. Next slide. Heather, I guess I'm passing it back to you. Yep, back to me. Um, so uh, the next question is how to apply. So we have purposely tried to keep this a very um, painless, um, not onerous application process. So. Um, the URL is there. You can also find it by Googling Aging Initiative MCC Scholars Program. Um, and uh, you will be asked to upload an NIH biosketch uh, and then provide just short responses, um, 400 words or less, to each of these um, uh, prompts. And this really does form um, the basis of, of our evaluation um, of, of your uh, prior work in, in MCC or related um, fields. It doesn't have to be that you've done multimorbidity or MCC devoted research before, but that you're in some sort of field that relates to MCC and you can show um, how you plan to um, use the network and the mentoring uh, to work in the area of MCCs. Um, and then importantly, um, how the research that you're doing uh, would have an impact on individuals living with MCCs. Next slide, I think it's back to you, Leah. So what is the review process? What are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, how will these applications uh, be evaluated? So we're looking for evidence of commitment to and productivity in research, and again, relevant to MCCs, but not necessarily um, in multimorbidity and appropriate to where you are in the stage of your career. 
We're also looking to um, create a balanced cohort of individuals. So we don't want 10 people studying multiple chronic conditions and cardiovascular disease. So we're, we're looking for a balanced um, and complementary uh, group of multidisciplinary researchers. So each candidate's application is assigned to four reviewers, two are scientific reviewers and two are patient caregiver advisory reviewers. Um, we're, we'll be scoring each section of your application. So again, there's your bio sketch is the first section, and then your answers to the questions for the four other areas, your interests and aspirations, um, evidence of your collaborative potential, impact on patients living with chronic conditions, and the goals for your participation in this program. Next slide. And back to you, Heather. Great, and now I have the pleasure of introducing um, two of the uh, patient caregiver advisors um, that are part of our network. So one of the great things about um, this network, really whether or not you participate in the MCC Scholars Program, um, it's good to know about the patient caregiver advisory panel, which we also call APCAC um, for short. <laughs> um, and um, uh, two of our patient caregiver advisors are joining us today to talk a little bit about the program and also just to introduce themselves. So I will let you go ahead and do that. Um, Rosie and Shri, will you introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, I'm Sherry Bins. I've been an RN for nearly 50 years. Um, I'm also internationally certified as an MS nurse, and I myself am living with six chronic comorbidities. Um, so I come to this both from a, a clinical aspect and from the lived experience. Um, you'll find that your advisors, all 10 of us, have experience in different um, healthcare backgrounds with different comorbidities, with different levels of education, but we've all been involved in research. You essentially have at your disposal a, a consulting firm of 10 individuals who are there to walk you through, help you through, work with you on your research projects. And I have to say when we reviewed projects or when we re reviewed applicants last year, um, there were so many, many good applications out there. But the ones that rose to the top were those who showed us that they engaged the patient in all aspects of the research, from the design, to recruitment, to assessment, to dissemination. So I encourage you as you're applying to look at those areas. Rosie? Hi, and I'm Rosie Vartell, and I'm not, my background is not in um, healthcare, it's in education. I was, um, my degree is in education and leadership, but um, 11 years ago, I had what I would consider one healthcare condition, and that was chronic arthritis, and le that led to um, joint replacements. And 11 years ago, I had a joint replacement that led to a MRSA staph infection. And one of the things that you will learn is that one chronic thing like this will lead to many other chronic things. So I don't even have a count about, of all the chronic things I have to deal with, but for the last eight years, I've been working with researchers because I felt that researchers really could make a difference and they were at the center of what was going to change how we look at healthcare in the future. And so I, I, I focused on working with researchers because of my background in education. And I've had this firm believer that um, if, if research is done well, and if researchers put patients at the center, then um, research will then change how we look at chronic conditions in the future and how we deal with chronic, multiple chronic conditions. And so that is why I'm part of this group. The other thing I want to say about this group is we are 10 individuals who were chosen not because we are new to the area, but because we've had lots of experience in um, multiple chronic conditions. 
and because we've also had experience working with research in other areas. So we come to you as strong advisors who really want to be engaged with you and want to help you make um, develop really strong grants and develop a really strong research program for yourself. Well, Chris, would you advance the slides, please? Um, just want to see if we've left anything out. Uh, I think we covered that slide, so let's go to slide 11. All right, as Rosie said, patients and caregivers are at the center of our research. Our research is designed to ease whatever they're going through. Um, we need to have our ear to the ground for what research is important to the end users. And as you can see here, each area of each bubble relates to one or two other bubbles where the patients and the caregivers relate to all. So it's really important that you focus on this uh, graphic here as you're designing your application, as you're thinking about your application to the MCC Scholar Program, because you have to fulfill all of this graphic in order to really be considered seriously. Yes, as Sherry said, and I said, the patient and the caregivers at the center, we are there to advise you, but we also, as we review this, we look at this in this way. We look at it, not how do we relate, how is the patient and caregiver related to each bubble, and how do you relate to the caregiver in each bubble? So it, it isn't always what you're researching, but how that research then relates back to the patient and caregiver. Um, I think it's real key to, to um, you looking at that piece. And at, if you're look, talking to anybody at this point, if it's any other kind of researchers or grant writers or um, any other areas, they will all tell you that maybe um, 10 years ago, patients and caregivers were not in the center of research, um, grants and research scholars, but today they are. And that is where the, the focus is because we are the end users. Whatever your research becomes, it is a patient or a caregiver and a caregiver who is going to benefit from that research. We all, you know, we are the end users. We are the people who will benefit. And when, you, when you're writing your scholarship papers, think about it that way. How am I going to help that patient and caregiver's life change? How am I going to help them deal with these chronic conditions? How am I going to, how is that end user's life going to be better because of the research I'm doing? And I think if you look at it that way, you have a very good chance of moving forward in this scholar program. I might also add that Carol um, Schulte is also on this webinar. She's another one of our advisors and her focus is on movement disorders. Okay, Chris. All right, um, so this is just highlighting the dates to keep in mind. So applications are due January 8th. We'll notify the next cadre by February 17th. And please do note that date that um, there is uh, the required attendance of what will this time be a virtual um, conference, but we still have opportunities for networking built into this virtual conference. So uh, we do ask that that people be able to attend those dates. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to just sort of clarify too is that um, you know, at, when you're submitting these applications, um, you're not proposing a research project um, for this application. We do have other um, opportunities for pilot projects and other sorts of things where, where a research proposal is being evaluated. But in this case, I think for, for some of you, um, one of the things that we love to do in the MCC Scholars Program is for somebody who maybe hasn't in the past had access to something like the Patient and Advisory Council and hasn't had um, training and how to how to um, meaningfully 
um, include patients and caregivers, we love to be able to, to train that. It's one of the skills um, that's part of our curriculum. And so hearing sort of the openness and willingness to do that and how you would use that in your research um, is just as important to us. So I don't want you to feel like you're disqualified if, if, if the honest truth is you haven't done that before. Um, but I think it's really important to, to let us know um, your openness and willingness to do that, your desire to do that, um, and, and how you certainly, how you see the, the work that you're doing and want to do, um, how it will impact patients and caregivers. Next slide. I think Leah's next. Okay, there's resources for more information. Um, you can see the website here. And then also the email for Chris, who is um, also on this call, but um, he can help if you have questions we haven't been able to answer. He can get those questions to us, but he's a great resource um, for submitting your application or getting more information. And next slide. Unmuting. Um, we are essentially at, at the end of um, the presentation part of this. So the next part is going to be for your questions. So please feel free to um, type into the um, chat box any questions that you have and we'll address them. Um, in the meantime, while you're typing, um, you might want to have a look too at some of these frequently asked questions. One of the most uh, common frequently asked questions is um, uh, if I have applied previously to be in the MCC Scholars Program and I was not selected, does it count against me? And, and the, it absolutely does not count against you. In each of the prior cycles, we have had way more meritorious applicants um, than we could accommodate. And so we love to see um, repeat applications. And to, to the point that Leah made earlier that, that oftentimes um, we, we've had applicants of such high quality that many of the decisions are made um, in trying to sort of have a balanced cohort of people of different disciplines, studying different kinds of things, different ge geographic locations. We try to have um, uh, demographic diversity and, and other factors are considered. So if you've applied to the program in the past and were not selected, First of all, don't take it, <laughs> don't take it personally and, and, and you're in very good company and um, please do um, apply again. Um, and I see we're getting some questions. Um, so a question that says, I'm a Canadian nurse researcher. Um, am I considered international? Um, I'm assuming that that is a person who's um, currently based in Canada. Um, Chris and Leah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think that at this time we are not able to accept international scholars. Is that true? I think we are. Is that what the third bullet point on the slide addresses? Yes. Okay, yes. Yes, international applicants may apply. Um, but if you do have um, questions about that, you can email um, Chris, but good, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, one of the uh, advents of being virtual, I suppose. Um, what are the types of grants will the scholars be eligible to apply for? Um, so um, that's a good question and, and um, it's not, exactly that there is a grant opportunity that you're only eligible to apply for if you're a scholar. Um, but um, there are other grant opportunities within the aging initiative. Um, and, and oftentimes the scholars are really well posi positioned to be able to be reviewed favorably for those. Um, Leah or Chris, do you have other? Maybe Chris, if you could put the link to the pilot program grants. I believe that RFA um, recently came out and that might be the one we mentioned that the Aging Initiative ha does have a pilot awards. You don't have to be a scholar to apply. And maybe we can put that website in the chat. I see here that Rosman um, asked, can type 2 diabetes and overweight or obesity count as MCCs? They certainly can. I see another question. Can people currently working in the intramural research program at NIH apply? 
And the answer I think would be yes. Um, you don't have to be a member of one of the two networks to apply um, to the scholars program. Heather or Leah, do you want to address Courtney's question? Yeah, the question is, are participants designated a mentor within the program as a point of contact? So the, the answer to that is you actually are um, given many points of contact um, of people who could be mentors and in, in affiliation with the, the annual meeting that that workshop um, in April, um, there in, in past years has been an assignment made um, mentor you know, I, I try to not use the term mentor lightly because I really do think mentoring implies sort of a longitudinal committed relationship. There's a, um, there is like a, a senior investigator match <laughs> made um, in, in past years. Um, and sometimes those have gone on to very organically blossom into a true mentoring relationship. Um, but that is also challenged in um, virtual times, obviously. So what's, what was nice in the, in the year when we were um, in person was you, everyone was assigned someone to sort of go and sit and have coffee or breakfast with. Um, it's a bit different now, <laughs> um, but we still do like to make that kind of match. But I wouldn't say that there's, there's a um, guaranteed mentorship that evolves out of it. I, I will really also... Just, go ahead. I just want to dovetail onto what you said, Heather, as far as the mentorships are concerned. When you're looking at resources, your advisory panel um, has developed bulleted bios that are basically a one page um, interests, uh, experience, uh, expertise. So you can, if it, say you're doing research in Parkinson's disease, for example. Um, you'll see on um, Carol's bulleted bio that she's got considerable experience with Parkinson's as a uh, patient caregiver. So you can choose an advisor or a mentor from that list also to carry you through your research project. Um, so that's another resource that's available in this network to you. Yes, I wanted to dovetail onto that too. I, I, I think, you know, there's... But, a multitude of different um, different diseases and different um, chronic conditions that are um, that we represent, that our group represents, that is going to be helpful, I think, to the scholars. And yes, frailty does fit. <laughs> yes. we, we really look at that. And I see that Chris has now dropped into the chat box um, that pilot award um, program, which again, um, scholars are in a really good position to review favorably for, for those awards. And as part of the, the program, um, you know, Ames page reviews and there's a mock study section as part of the workshop in April. So there are certainly opportunities as part of the program to sort of strengthen applications for multiple funding opportunities. Um, there is a question that I saw about, um, does the scholarship cover any research costs? Um, no, it, it, it does not um, come with a stipend um, for performing any research. Um, it did in the past cover travel, um, when we were able to travel. Um, advice for repeat applicants, uh, how to improve your application. And I think um, this is a conversation that's going on. Talk to us, don't talk at us. Um, keep your language conversational rather than scientific. Um, there were several applicants last year that were excellent, but there was so much science speak in it that we weren't really sure how you were going to engage the patient and how the patient might benefit from your research. Um, so I, I would just say um, be less uh, trying to impress with the language 
that you're putting into your application and more with trying to develop a connection. Yeah, any other um, advice that you would give for repeat applicants improving application? Another thing I might say is to note if over the year since the last time that you applied, if there are ways um, that your work has involved questions about MCC more, or if you're thinking around MCC has evolved, um, that's a helpful thing for us to, to hear and understand. And I think if you think about the last section of the application and, and what you want to get out of the program is being um, being less vague, being more focused on, you know, where are you trying to get to, what gap do you have, and do you, how do you see the scholars helping you fill that gap by learning a new skill, um, getting connected to the stakeholder team, um, learning new analytical techniques. So I think you know, what are you, what are the, what's the new thing you're trying to learn? Um, I think that would be really helpful um, for improving your application if you haven't done that in the past. Um, Iris says, I'm a tenured associate professor, professor in biostatistics. I'm very interested in MCC in aging studies. From a modeling point of view, will this align with the expectations of the program? My understanding is that the program will give priority to junior investigators. Good. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, so it is true that um, the, the priority, right, the, the priority goes to people um, non-tenured prior to first R01, but it, it, um, there is no harm in applying and we are very interested in having biostatisticians and methodologists um, as part of the program. Um, again, in, our, in service to our goal to um, really create a pool of people that come from multiple different disciplines, bring multiple different skill sets, and form a natural pool of potential collaborators for each other. The other Apparently the link that Chris put up is, is flawed. People are, several people are unable to access it. And I, I think someone maybe, um, I think we might have a, a, a new, a fresh link that seems to be working now, we'll see. Um, There's a question about behavioral interventions and. And um, I, would, could one of you answer that? Sure, Siobhan Mingo asked, has there been a focus on behavioral interventions in the past? And I guess the answer would be no. We really look for a wide diversity of interests uh, between um, the, the members of the MCC scholars. So we haven't had a focus. I think that there would be an interest in that area, but we, we don't have a specific focus there. Okay. Somebody else asked if there was a list of the current scholars. Yes, they are on the Aging Initiative website. And another thing that I, that I wanted to, to stress regarding uh, uh, with some of the questions of, um, you know, the, the recognizing that this is not a program that gives you um, salary support or project support. One of the things that we have really tried to do is to protect your time um, and be respectful of your time during the project. So there's um, a, a fairly small amount of time um, requested to participate in the program. And we really have tried hard and, and in, um, adjusted, refined the program based on feedback from prior scholars, um, which was, um, has been really highly positive. Um, but also really try to use their feedback and engage them and trying to make um, the time as meaningful as meaningful for you as possible. Um, and I wanted to sort of say that even goes for the application. So again, the sort of asking, is it, is it worth my applying? We've, we've tried to make the, the activation energy involved in applying um, as minimal as possible um, to encourage um, wide number of applicants. And uh, I, Ra sorry, Ravachandra asked the question about uh, work on gut health. Um, and he's wondering whether that experience would, in the clinical setting, would be considered for his application. Yeah, Heather, I wanted to ask you about that one too. So it looks like that's in a primate model. And then there's another question below 
from Perry talking about mechanisms of MCCs and how well that would match. I know in the past we haven't had uh, many basic science investigators in our cohorts, but I'm wondering if what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I think as long as the translational potential um, is, is clear and that there is um, that you can sort of draw that line and, and articulate how the mechanistic work or the, the animal model work would apply to patients and caregivers. Um, that's obviously something that we emphasize, but um, I think that, that as, long as, there's, as long as the translational potential is clear, um, if, if you're a completely bench-based or animal model-based scientist, it's also worth considering that there is, um, you know, a part of our curriculum, one of the three sort of pillars of, of our curriculum is about how to invite, how to engage patient and caregivers in your research. Um, I think it's actually a real opportunity um, for, for translational scientists to do the same. So although it's, it's done, you know, it's it increasingly clinical researchers are starting to do that more and more. Um, as long as as a as a basic or bench scientist, you'd be open to that that idea too, and welcome training on how to do that. Um, then I, I think this could be a program for you. A couple of people have mentioned that they want to know if discussions with the the presenters on this call can continue beyond the call, and um, I think yes, by contacting Chris. Um, our contact information can be disseminated if you there's a specific individual you have questions for. Yes, the question about psori psoriatic arthritis is a definite yes. Um, I think there was a path one else on frailty, which I would yep. say would be a yes as well. We appreciate all the questions. No crickets today on this, <laughs> this call. Um, I apologize if we've missed any. So if you want to keep typing, we're kind of scrolling through to make sure we're addressing everyone's questions. Question about I'm working with large databases and how best could I include patient and caregivers? Um, so we, we certainly have had um, other researchers that work primarily with um, administrative or, or epidemiological databases. Um, and absolutely, um, I, 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 those, those researchers have found it extremely beneficial to involve um, the patient and caregiver input on formulating their questions um, and interpreting their results. Rosie and Cherie, do you have anything to add to that? I agree. I have I have worked with researchers that have worked with large data databases, and and they have you know used me especially to help formulate the questions and and to and and then even to look at the results be, because sometimes they the results doesn't ring clear to them because they come from a different point of view than a patient does sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the patient caregiver point of view tends to run towards um, quality of life issues rather than maybe curative issues. So if you could keep that in mind when you're, you're developing your application or your research questions, um, there has been in the last 10 years a significant shift in putting that um, patient voice, patient need in the center rather than something that's determined as a need by a researcher. So. Uh, a lot has been focused around not what's the matter with you, but what matters to you. And I think that has become, and especially in the, the world that we're in right now, what matters to, to the patient has become really a focal point and so, you know, and it's added to some of the chronic conditions because that has not been addressed well. So, you know, um, you, you know you, there definitely is a need for having patients and caregivers and what matters to them as center and looking at that from that point of view. 
there's a rampant phrase out there that's gaining momentum by the day. It's nothing about me without me. Um, I used to use that phrase 10 years ago and people looked at me silly. Today, everybody knows what that means. I'm excited to see these applications come in. It sounds Me like we've too. got some real interest here. Me too. And I, oh, I see another. Sounds that the program is lifelong. Yes, we, we like to say once an MCC scholar, always an MCC scholar. Yeah, that we've invited our first year cohort to our second year cohort activities, which um, extends that peer network as well and gives you continuing um, opportunity uh, to interact with um, the aging initiative. And yes, Christina, the advisory panel members are listed on the website. Yes. Yes to Siobhan, that research agenda definitely fits with the goals of the program. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris, for uh, posting the link that shows a, a, the list of our APCAC advisory members. We need all four sets of eyes on this chat box today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Iris. I and thank again, all the scholars for all the wonderful questions. It's, it's great to have that much enthusiasm. Yeah, we appreciate everyone joining us today. Again, we really tried to make a, a low burden, low entry application, 400 words addressing the four questions. Um, one of those particularly focused on the patient and caregiver um, important idea. And uh, the fifth area is the biosketch. So hopefully it's, uh, we encourage you all to apply. We are excited to get to know more about you and appreciate those of you who applied in the past. We look forward to you reapplying. And your advisors also have their bio sketches on file. Yes. Uh, for, for researchers who are newly getting into the MCC area, are there suggestions on the applications? Um, what I, I think that I would do, since we will have your bio sketch, um, and if it's clear that you haven't published in this area before, um, acknowledge that and talk about what's drawing you to want to study this field, what you're specifically looking to learn and get from the program. Um, and again, that, that important piece of, of how you think getting training about MCC will improve the impact of your work um, for, for patients and caregivers or make it more relevant. So I think it, there's, no, there's no shame in not having done this before. It's okay. You can just articulate why you want to. And I think people who are coming back, you know, and, and this is maybe your second, third time that you're applying. Remember that you probably had a good application of, in the first place, but also look at, you know, what, what has changed? Why are you reapplying? What, what's, what's more important to you now than maybe was important? important to you a year or two ago. So look at those things. Think about what really has changed in your thinking or why this has become a more of a critical topic for you. Yeah, and you still have the opportunity if you haven't done MCC's research before. It's on your bio sketch, but in the, in the question asking you about demonstrating your collaborative research, you can talk about what you have done in the field where you have published. So you still need to do that and then identify in the other section around um, what are you hoping to get out of the program? What is that gap? How does that fill this? Where can this take you? So we are pretty purposeful about having four separate sections. They're all very important. And then your, your bio sketches is you as a person. You have to know this application is very clear. It, it definitely is point on. It's not one of these applications where you can fake it. You better, you know, it definitely is a very clear cut application and it should be very easy to answer the questions because of the 400 words 
but also because it's clear. I will also stress that you don't have to write 400 words. That's, that's the, <laughs> it'll cut you off at 400 words. That's a maximum, but I would say many people feel that they could answer those questions and even less, and that is fine. Well, I, I think maybe we're seeing like a, a tapering off of the questions. I wanted to certainly um, say that I'm happy to communicate with anyone by email. So um, you can find, find my email address through Chris um, or uh, on the web, but it's easy. It's heather.whitson at do.edu. And Chris is welcome to share, I'm sure Sherry or my email with anyone that would like to. Absolutely. Yes. And I'm sure Carol would feel the same way. And a question about postdoctoral fellows. Um, yeah, the, the stipulation is just that you, you do have to have, have your degree, but. Um, <clears throat> Great. Great. Well, I, I don't know if we have a conclusion slide, Chris, or if this is our. No, I think one. it was just a question. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're there. All right. Well, if there are any additional questions or if there were any that we um, inadvertently missed, please do uh, reach out by email. And again, thank you. We look forward to seeing um, your applications. Appreciate the engagement. Thank you for reaching Thanks out to everybody. us. Thank you, everyone.